Coming up next on This Week in Computer Hardware, Intel's 10 nanometer Ice Lake processors, benchmarked AMD updates 570 drivers, are some NVIDIA RTX Super GPUs fake? And yes, people, Newton lives on. All that more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 527, recorded on August 1st, 2019. Intel's Ice Lake gets the cold shoulder. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online privacy with one click. Yes, it is that easy. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash twitch. Welcome to Twitch, this week in Computer Hardware, Twitch Weekly Show that aims to bring you the most useful, most delightful, most engaging, most affordable, most expensive, most outrageous, most benign hardware news anywhere, I think. I'm Patrick Norton, joined by Sebastian Peake, who is vibrating with excitement somewhere deep in the heartland of Michigan, contemplating 10th generation mobile parts Intel at 10 nanometers in laptops. They call it Ice Lake. They do. Are you excited or are you just, um, it, I mean, I actually, I should say this is not an underwhelming CPU upgrade, especially for Intel. That's a or double negative. It, it is an underwhelming. No, upgrade. no, no. Uh, it I will say it isn't. It, it is unless you're excited about the new graphics and the graphics are really interesting because they went with this new Graphics architecture, it's called Gen 11. They do have new CPU architecture here too, Sunny Cove. Right. What we're seeing first is not desktops, so not the you know fast enthusiast stuff like we saw with their i9 refresh, like the ninth generation 9900K and then the upcoming KS. This is laptop. This is U-series and Y-series laptop parts. So we're talking up to 25 watts, depending on how the OEM configures it. Nominally 15 watt parts and below. And... Intel was bringing media out. I was not one of the ones who went. I, you know, was, it, a lot of us were invited. I wasn't able to go. And they had, it was interesting. This is, this is something that they've never done before, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Bringing out media kind of the way that phone launches are handled by Qualcomm. When they come out with a new Snapdragon processor, they fly media out and under controlled circumstances using a dev a developer device, not necessarily just a board, but usually something that looks like a phone, maybe a little bit chunkier than a phone. They have you check it out, run whatever benchmarks you want, and they let you load your own onto there. So obviously you don't have to worry as much about, um, you know, in fishiness. <laughs> yeah. Things that Fakiness. anybody who, yeah, a lot of, a lot of the editors bring their own uh, benchmarks as they want to use the exact same right. version that they were using back at the office so they can compare it against their existing phones and, and laptops. And that's exactly what Intel did with this, where they had media come out. There was a development platform, which looked like a laptop. It mm -hmm. had bigger bezels and was thicker than most laptops these days. And the other sort of caveat about the results that editors were allowed to publish was that the testing that they did, and they could use their own benchmarks. The testing was run on one of these dev platforms that had a fan going 100% of the time, like 100%. Right. So it thermally not really constrained like a, a real thin and light will be. So I imagine that some of the numbers that we saw will be lower when mm -hmm. production machines are out there. Or maybe they'll be higher because the drivers will be more mature. I, but if if you look at what like Tom's Hardware and Nontech, uh, Legit Reviews and others have published so far, it's depending on the application, uh, some some improvements like IPC is definitely higher. You'll see that probably in Geekbench more than some of the others. Uh, over extended workloads, there were some improvements, but again, some of that might be more thermal than anything. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely with the 25 watt mode, they were getting some faster results, and you know, like in Handbrake, it was significantly faster once you went up to 25 watts, of course, because it could it could sustain boost frequencies longer. One of the interesting things about these new processors is they have rather low clock speeds. Turbo speeds are still high. You're still talking mid to high 3 gigahertz up into 4, 4.1 .1 gigahertz, but base clocks are down as far as 1 gigahertz, which wow. I think the slowest... 
base clock I can remember recently was my original, like my Gen 1 ThinkPad Yoga, which was a uh, Haswell, I think, and that was 1.6 gigahertz, and it was one of the slower i5s that year. So to go all the way down to 1.0, 1.1 at the bottom end, and I think they're still in like the 2, 2.5 range with the high end. But, mm -hmm. you know, boost clock still somewhere around 4 gigahertz on the higher SKUs. So it's to me, this is more about the potential for power savings because they can operate at lower clocks. They're going to be on 10 nanometer for the first time. And... Uh, the IPC, the instructions per clock, the clock for clock improvements that they made with the new architecture allow them to get similar or even slightly better results at lower clock speeds. So it, with mobile, it's all you really want. You want better battery life. There are other things, too. We're not going to get into every detail, but they talked about some of the first that they have. And one of them is uh, Wi-Fi 6. A lot of things right. are integrated to the new platform. So Wi-Fi 6 support, four channels of Thunderbolt 3 are built in. So... There's going to be better connectivity in general with the upcoming laptops, which will be nice to see. I mean, I have a, a brand new ThinkPad right here. This is a T490S, and it's still on Whiskey Lake, which is the 8000 stuff, because that's what's out there. So, you know, on desktop, we have some 9th gen. Laptops are also 8th gen. So uh, by the end of the year, we will be seeing some of these in shipping machines, and we can make our own, you know, performance assessment at that time. But it's, it is a bit underwhelming, unfortunately. It's kind of like two weeks in a row. We talked about RTX 2080 Super last week. <laughs> underwhelming. And 10th gen Intel stuff. The graphics part is great. And they're, they're able to use much faster memory now. 3733, I think, was the frequency of this uh, LPDDR4X memory. But And that's right. great for integrated graphics. Faster memory, better integrated graphics performance. But... Not so much on the CPU side. I don't know. Were you similarly underwhelmed? You know, I I I was hoping for more, but then again, uh, where laptops are concerned, I think I'm always hoping for larger jumps in performance than you see, and that's probably incredibly unreasonable. Uh, I've also been playing around with some giant, eleven pound ish. I exaggerate slightly. Uh, you know, lunch tray size workstation laptops, and it's kind of interesting what you can do when you pretty much remove uh, all thermal restrictions, because <laughs> you have you know giant uh, giant pathways to move air over the processor. Um, yeah, you know it's you know it, okay you know it's nothing massive, but it's a start. Um, one of the things you know. There's no link in the in the show notes. I apologize for that. Um, the uh, no, there it is. Uh, the new AMD chipset drivers, Ryzen three thousand, the five seventy chipset drivers. I was curious because you know five seventy, as has been kind of a tradition for AMD, you know high end AMD chipset launches. The five seventy launch was a bit of a train wreck. Uh, I exaggerate. A little bit, um, but you know, it would run, but it wouldn't do a lot of the things you bought the expensive, uh, you know, top of the line new chipset for. Um, is this fixed most of it? Um, also, got to give props to Jeremy Hellstrom for his gentle understatement. Uh, AMD have just released a new 570 driver version 1.07.29 to address concerns some expressed about the processors using too many cores at high clock speeds and voltages when the user felt it should be idling at low frequencies. Um, you yeah, know, there's been so, a lot of talk about the, the idle behavior, and Robert right. Halleck um, from AMD has been talking about this. There was a community update a couple of days ago discussing mm -hmm. this and basically this, and these are new chipset drivers that just came down. So this is independent of what will be coming down from motherboard vendors. Right. So like the destiny Two issue that there's a, a beta fix for in this driver, if that was the only thing you were having issues with, if you actually wanted to play that game, right. it was crashing. Uh, if you were running Ryzen 3000, so stability, Seems to be fine. I have not heard any complaints about Destiny 2 no, no longer opening after running this update. There will be another Agisa code update coming. And for the, for this reason, the fact that we're now on, this is going to be version 1.0.0.3 ABB, because apparently <laughs> appending further numbers or actually changing a number is completely out of the question. So we're, we're adding letters. We went from A to AB. 
So now ABB is coming. And I keep I, seeing... I wonder if... Uh... I wonder if they're refusing to change the number because they're trying to reserve the number changes for actual, you know, feature additions or or something more significant than, you know, not making it behave like your foot's on the floor of the accelerator even when you're stopped at a stop sign. Um, you know, to use a, a middling. <laughs> and I don't want to hear any comparisons metaphor. to the 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 alleged uh, issues with the Prius accelerator back in the day. If it's not quite to that extent, no, the uh, floor mat is not getting stuck to your floor pedal. It was just idling with too high a voltage and speed. And it only requires a simple firmware update on your board or right. software update. So the software fix can take care of it. They also released a new version of their Ryzen Master software, right. uh, which I was playing around with last night, actually. And I have to say, my X570 experience, even running this new software with the latest version mm -hmm. of Ryzen Master, still all over the place and that's partly because i'm still on a launch version of the bios it actually does have 1.0.0.3 a b combo update on it i think it's the a b might be the a i get confused by these letters apparently but new <laughs> updates are coming i hope that it addresses some of the memory issues that i continue to have at least from one vendor i'm going to be trying out another vendor and see because, it, you know, it's it's funny. I had a Gigabyte X470 board that I did all of my testing for with the Ryzen 3700X and 3900X. Ran 3200 megahertz memory absolutely flawlessly, even low low latency memory, like CAS 14, pretty aggressive timings at 1.35 volts. Right. Overclocked memory, absolutely flawlessly, no stability issues. I didn't have a single blue screen. And on X570, I've had blue screens, random reboots, uh the system crashes to a like a, a default bio state and lowers my memory speed back to 2400 again so that kind of stuff it's it's just early days and unfortunately for me even running the new software i still don't have 3200 megahertz cl14 stable on an x570 board so cl14 does seem kind of aggressive I also it's pretty say, aggressive I feel so yeah. Yeah, I feel so good about you know having a B450 and and uh, <laughs> I'm going to wait until like 3950s are available uh, before I start dabbling with 570 or 3900s for that matter. Uh, it's, well, I, mean, I, don't know, it's, I should have I should have added this 3900 non X is rumored, but we have nothing nothing but some rumors, so I'll have to wait to talk about that. Non X yeah. 3700 and 3900 would be very interesting parts well 3700x's have been oh yeah there's oh they're in stock on august 9th now uh they were supposed mm. to be back in stock on august 6th um 2700 prices are still at the same level uh although it's uh it's funny the 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 delta between the wraith spire led cooler and the wraith prism led cooler is uh uh, over sixty dollars. <laughs> so you know, if you plan on swapping the cooler for something you already own uh, or a third-party cooler, by all means, get the cheaper twenty-seven hundred X. Although I gotta say, you know, uh, if you can save up the money for a thirty-seven hundred X, do it um, over the twenty-seven hundred X from a pure performance standpoint. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna stop before we get into a long random discussion <laughs> of. Uh, of uh you know ryzen 3000 volume 7 but you know as you said let's amplify it you know no signs of 3900s anywhere except maybe micro center if you happen to live near one it can go in to buy one um what's going on with the uh so rtx 2060 2070 super um there's rumors that you can flash those and update those to so basically a 2070 or 2080 yeah and this is, if you're familiar with Tech Power Up, uh, and even if you aren't, actually, you're probably familiar with the GPU Z utility. It's sort of like the the standard for identifying graphics cards. And they're they're working on an update. So in mm -hmm. going through, they noticed some different uh, hardware IDs being reported in Windows for the same GPUs. And of course, different cards, different add-in card, uh, add-in board vendors. But ultimately, comparing those against their Founders Edition cards, they've identified three different versions for each, uh, the RTX 2060 and RTX 2070. So they kind of speculate about this. They go into some detail in this article about it. 
But what it boils down to is it's suggestive of perhaps either vendors like the add board partners or NVIDIA on their end either slightly modifying or simply flashing or some combination thereof these cards, these existing cards in the supply chain to create super inventory, which initially sounds ludicrous because you would be taking a card like the 2080 as a $699 price tag or higher, like the Founders Edition card is $799, and then you would be you know, potentially flashing it so that it only operates as a 2070 super, and that card is being sold for $499. So if, hmm. if this is happening, they speculate that there might be some sort of a rebate on future GPU purchases or some other kind of compensation coming from NVIDIA. But this might have been, I wondered how NVIDIA could possibly take the 2060 Super up to literally RTX 2070 levels, like stock RTX 2070 levels, and sell it for $399 and not have it completely cannibalize the sales of existing 2070s in the supply chain. And maybe they don't have to worry about that because there was some sort of deal arranged to get those 2070s sold as 2060 Supers. I'm not sure. And the difference in performance between those two cards is so small that I would personally right. not bother with trying to do a potentially risky flash, even if they determine that it is in fact simply that the BIOS of the card has been flashed to disable a certain amount of the performance that's actually on the die. Because we're talking about the same GPU die. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of how it's configured. So does that mean it was configured by NVIDIA? Does it mean that they put a small resistor on the PCB at the add-in board factory, or maybe they removed one, so it's reported as a different uh, hardware ID and you know operates differently? We don't know, but it is certainly interesting. And they, it's a pretty detailed look at this in the Tech Power Up article. And you know, I, I bought their explanation, basically. And they were they were pretty fair about it by talking about some of the price differentials and how they might have actually done this from a business standpoint. Uh, but yeah, I, I think if potentially if they don't do something like this, then there's going to be inventory of 2070s just sitting. It was not, <laughs> and we've talked about this since the beginning of the year. The RCX right. series was not the hot seller that NVIDIA would have liked it to be. And to additionally have you know, within a year's time, in less than a year's time, replace the 2070 and 2080 completely in your product lineup. And then essentially make the 2060 fast enough for a $50 price increase to completely negate the need to buy the $500 card. It's, it's, I would not want to be the reseller right now who's sitting looking at stacks of 2080s and 2070s and saying, I'm never going to sell these cards. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by ExpressVPN. It, look, you may think you're not being snooped on. You're wrong. Your ISP, the network you're connected to, the free coffee shop Wi-Fi, there's all sorts of weird things going on, and that's even without thinking about hackers and security. If you're not running a VPN, you should. I run a VPN, especially when I travel, because, quite frankly, I'm paranoid, and I'm paranoid for good reasons. One, sometimes I just don't want to share what I'm doing with my ISP, actually pretty much all the time. And I'm not doing anything nefarious. I just don't particularly feel like being tracked. And if you're using the coffee shop Wi-Fi, if you're in, goodness help you, uh, you know, a, an airport, airport Wi-Fi is a little sketch, and people do weird stuff, do yourself a favor. Don't go online. Don't do anything serious without running a VPN first. That's why I recommend you use ExpressVPN to protect your online activity. Powerful encryption secures your data. It allows you to geolocate. You can pretend you're somewhere else, which you may care about, you may not care about. But look, doesn't matter. ExpressVPN just runs in the background, protects your data, keeps your data wrapped in a layer of encrypted, it's just encrypted goodness all the way to when it pokes its head out on the internet and grabs the package you need. Runs in the background. You know, you download it, you install it, you click once to connect, you're protected. Do yourself a favor. Don't go online without a VPN like ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is fast. It costs less than $7 a month. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And they've got a new cutting-edge server technology called Trusted Server. It prevents the operating system and apps from ever writing to the hard drive. It is a whole new standard of privacy and security, they tell me. Do yourself a favor. It's time. Stop hackers, big brother, and internet companies from grabbing all your data. Take back your online privacy with ExpressVPN. 
Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three extra months free with a one-year package at expressvpn.com slash twitch. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash twitch for three extra months free with a one-year package. Visit expressvpn.com slash twitch to learn more. And we want to thank ExpressVPN for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Oh, my goodness. Uh, NZXT H510 Elite case reviewed. This is, uh, I am fascinated. It reminds me of the headlights on certain models of cars where there's just LED rings. <laughs> yeah. It looks stylish. If you're watching the video right now, uh, you know, you should just go to PCPer.com and search for the NZXT H510 Elite case review. Um this is an interesting design, right? It's got a solid white base, and above that, it has lots of glass. And uh, it's not outrageously expensive. It's not cheap. It's $170. Uh, but it looks really stylish, and it looks smaller than it, it... I think it looks smaller than it actually is, or maybe it, it's bigger than it looks in the photos. Um, you know, is it... <sighs> I don't know. I mean, it's, I got to say, it's got this really interesting combination of minimalism and giant glass windows. And as people who've been listening to this show for far too long know, I am so over the glass windows, but this is kind of stylish. Um, this is an interesting design to me. Yeah. Was it's it, all uh, about easy to build with? Too. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, it's easy <laughs> to, yeah, it's easy to build. And if you've built in any of the NZXT cases in the last few years, I think the first one like this that I built in was the S340. And this is very similar to the H500 series from last year. Mm -hmm. This is the refresh, H510. And they also have an H710 and 710i. And the, mm -hmm. the, the difference between a lot of these cases from NZXT isn't so much the layout. It's right. uh, whether or not they inc include their RGB fans, whether or not they have their, their smart controller. And this is the second generation of that controller that's in this. And it basically lets you interface with it from an available USB header on the motherboard. And then their IQ, is it IQ? I'm, no, I'm thinking of Corsair. This is their CAM software that lets you go in and, and do everything. Like you can tweak your, there's eight lighting zones per fan. There's a separate lighting strip in this Elite case. And you can synchronize color with whatever you have on your motherboard as well. If you choose to use one of those motherboard headers. But the software lets you change all the the profiles, the fan speeds, and so it's it has a lot of of uh, convenience sort of control features, and even some stuff like system wide overclocking and other things you can do. But it, looking at it just as an enclosure, uh, like you said, it's it's like a quarter of it is metal. It's like a a steel, and then the top two thirds to three quarters are all glass. At least on two sides, it's solid glass front panel. Solid glass side panel. Mm -hmm. And with cases like this, ventilation is at a premium. You, you you go for either the appearance or the functionality. And on this one, the only air intake for the front is on the rear side panel. And it's a strip that's less than two inches wide. So uh, if that's enough air intake for your build, then you know you won't be thermally constrained. I put in a fairly high-end build in this machine. It was a uh, my GPU testbed system actually put into this, so it was a high-end Core i7 processor, and I used an RTX 2070 and Asus Strix card, so not a a low-end GPU by any means. And there was enough ventilation, especially because of uh, an exhaust at the top, and uh, you know a, a large exhaust at the rear, 140 millimeter fan installed on that. There was enough air moving out of the back of the case to keep things from getting too toasty. I never came anywhere near thermal limits on anything, but certainly the temps are nowhere near what they would be with a high airflow case. You're just never going to right. get those low temps when you have, even with this case, which comes with two nice RGB 140 millimeter fans on the front, they're, there's an inch and a quarter away, a solid thick piece of tempered glass and only a ventilation uh, port on one side. So it's uh, the debate about this since uh, just since I posted this review and actually in the last year or two when we've seen so many uh, mm -hmm. tempered glass and RGB everything designs is that you're choosing aesthetics over functionality 
if a case has an open front panel and mesh with some sort of a screen filter, that's all you need. And you can run and you don't really have to worry about noise levels because you can run lower speed fans inside the case and your GPU fans might not even accelerate as much because right. that, that RPM ramping up is because of largely with, with designs like this, ambient temperature matters quite a bit. So uh, that was kind of the, the end result of this. Like the conclusion of the review is that it's a very well realized for this type of case. And that's, that's the thing. There's a caveat. Right. Like, do you want your whole enclosure surrounded by tempered glass? You're going to sacrifice airflow. And if, <laughs> if you're purely, cause it's hard to move air through solid glass. <laughs> yes. I mean, and if you put too many holes in glass, it's not going to be very strong anymore. So I don't think I've seen that yet. Like, uh, I, I immediately think of a horror story where years ago when I worked in retail and we had TVs put on display, uh, somebody actually thought it was a good idea, and I was not around for this, to drill directly down into the base of a TV that had a tempered glass base because they had to attach them to the shelves. And, of course, the thing exploded into a million pieces <laughs> and, you know, they dropped the TV. So you don't want to do that to glass. And this this case... Very, very, very well made. Like the, the way the glass panel attaches was clever. It has like Lian Lee style clips on it. And, you know, you're you're going to be happy if you like tempered glass. You're not going to be happy if you're after the ultimate low temps because the temps inside of this are going to run like 5, 10 degrees higher than they would in a case right. with better airflow. Oh, my goodness. Speaking of uh, compromises or perhaps disappointments, uh, the rumor uh sam mobile actually uh pulled this one up and it caught my eye uh galaxy note 10 3.5 millimeter USB-C adapter pictured in leak uh so samsung's been leaking things it seems to be the new samsung launch lifestyle um but uh it looks that uh that if you're watching the video, is the USB-C to 3.5 millimeter headphone jack adapter, which pretty much confirms the rumors that started a few months ago that there will be no headphone jack in the Note 10. So, or the I should say the Note 10 and the Note 10 Plus. Um, one of the holdouts <laughs> on the high-end Android uh, headphone jack front. But uh, I'm not particularly surprised because it's certainly direction, the direction that most companies are going. Um, I, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting to see that, right? Cause you, I I I I'm, I'm I I guess I'm a little speechless at the moment because I'm <laughs> I, I'm listening. It's well I'm I'm laughing because I was listening to a set of really really nice uh, Mr. Speaker's Aeon Flow uh, headphones, and you can drive them with a headphone jack on my phone, but they do a lot better with significantly more power. So I was using a um, uh, AudioQuest Dragonfly Red, so that's a USB adapter which goes from USB to C adapter which plugs into the back of the phone, and I was thinking about that because. Man, you know, you look at the Pixel 3a, 399 dollars phone from Google, and they experimented with putting a headphone jack in it. You know, the headphone jack that nobody has room for anymore. Uh, and oddly enough, they got most of the camera and most of the features uh, from the high-end phones, and managed to somehow fit a 3.5 millimeter jack in it without uh, any problems. Um, so, you know, it's you know the. You know, Bluetooth, especially if you have the latest versions uh, or access to Aptex, uh, or if you're a particularly rare corner of the universe, LDAC, I don't think is particularly common, which is Sony's version of Aptex, which is essentially a way to throw more bandwidth at the Bluetooth connection between your headphones and your phone. Um, it's not as big an issue, but it's it's interesting for me to watch the sort of continue decline. And I also am wondering if next year we might see you know, either a higher end Pixel phone or some of the higher end Samsung phones flirting with headphone jacks again, or if, you know, uh, the Google Pixel 3a is just an odd, uh, an odd phone out in terms of having a headphone jack. But, uh, I think the latter is probably it. I think it's an aberration. Maybe they just had some <laughs> parts. They recycled the camera from an older Pixel phone. It's a, it's a fantastic value. And I love the fact that it has a headphone jack, but Right. Look at flagship devices like this upcoming Galaxy. I, I have no, I, I have, there's no doubt to me anyway. You harbor no illusions. Are accurate. 
I mean, yeah. Everybody wants Bluetooth. Like it, uh, Bluetooth headsets, I think around $20 is the low end of what I see now on Amazon. I can't imagine what $20 Bluetooth headphones sound like, but uh, that's what everybody wants. It seems like for for AirPods are absolutely dominant when it comes to Bluetooth, mm -hmm. like true wireless headphones. And there are so many knockoffs and, you know, Beats, which of course Apple now owns, has their own uh, true wireless he headphones and just just headsets. If, if you're if you're going around wearing a headset like this, there's plenty of room for, for right. wireless to be incorporated in this. You don't have to worry about like there can be a band from one year, your, your piece to the other piece. And that's all standard. It's all been done to death. But, you know, just well, I mean, the headphone jack itself, I mean. Sorry, sorry. Um, just the if you look at how people use their phones, and I'm around right. plenty of people who use phones pretty much constantly, to the point where you never see them without their phone in their hand. They're constantly looking down at their phone. Uh, mm -hmm. These are not people who ever have a cord coming out of their phone unless they're charging it, and it's so <laughs> inconvenient for them. Like my wife will listen to things playing out of her phone speaker instead of right. getting a pair of headphones. You know, it's just, I've been dealing with that for a few years. I'm like, why, why? It's so tinny and, and terrible, but you know, all the stereos and speakers around here and she chooses to listen to it out of a, a speaker because it's convenient. And she got a pair of AirPods and she actually uses them now. And that was what it took for her was it, it needed right. to be in a little case where it's always charged, put them in your ears. They're immediately paired, just put them back in the case when you're done. Otherwise she wouldn't use headphones at all. So I, I see so few examples. Maybe I'm hanging out in the wrong places, but I don't see a lot of people using <laughs> old school headsets like this with a cord coming out of them. They just, I don't think they care. Uh, the, no, the hardest I think most people don't. phone users I know. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It's interesting because I've been, I don't know if you can quite see that. I don't think it's going to refocus. It's got to go right in uh, front of your face. It's, there we go. There it is. That is uh, Cambridge Audio, uh, one of their Melomania, uh, and it's, you know, true wireless. They sell for about $130 a pair. And I was actually surprised at how good they are for the money. Um, the microphones are atrocious. I think that's one of the big challenges when you have something this small in your ear is whether or not you actually have a decent uh, microphone experience. And, you know, these could use a little bit of help. Musically, they're fantastic for the money. And you're running something in the neighborhood of nine hours of battery life from the earbuds themselves, uh, and then another 36 hours in the charging case. And I have to say, is I've been playing around with a bunch of uh, wireless earbuds lately, and you know, more wireless earbud manufacturers could follow the example of having a fairly small case because this actually fits in my pocket without creating a giant bulge. Um, and uh, I will also say it's amazing how all just over the all over the map the audio performance of a lot of the wireless earbuds are at this point, uh, which I I'd like to say I find shocking, which I don't. Uh, you know, I can say I find it, it's amazing how there are some fairly expensive one hundred and sixty, two hundred fifty dollar, uh, one hundred sixty, two hundred, two hundred fifty dollar earbuds that just sound like ass to use a highly uh, defined audio term. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, I don't know. It's frustrating. Uh, on the upside, it's amazing what you can get performance wise out of a USB C adapter and an external USB dongle. But, you know, let's face it, uh, you and I are going to carry something like this around attached to our phone, and the vast majority of the planet will just be like, no, I think not. Um, <laughs> so, don't even we'll get me started on car audio connections and how most cars don't come with you know, any kind of CD player or of course no tape deck anymore. And it's, it's all about some sort of either USB connection or more likely Bluetooth people who have, you know, the Bluetooth maybe a connection really nice in music our library car, or, the, it's funny, but the, like the, the Bluetooth connection in our car isn't that bad, but a big part of that is because the, 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 the Bluetooth connection in, in the car, the car itself lets through so much road noise, you can't actually hear a lot of the issues. <laughs> that is it, <laughs> exactly. Uh, now, but, yeah, it's, uh, it, satellite radio is another topic entirely. I'm not going to get into that, but even listening to your average quality streaming service, which is usually somewhere around 256 kilobits per second, that sounds just fine over road noise. 
And I'd actually, I actually, I mean, I gotta say, like Spotify, for example, is 300 kilobits per second. That sounds pretty fantastic. Um, you know, it you, you have to work at it. After, you have to have a decent system to hear the difference. Yes. No. It. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree. I'm just saying once it's been recompressed using Bluetooth, doesn't sound so right. awesome anymore. Well, and Apple it's tries nice to, to mitigate this by using AAC instead of right. the SPC codec. And it, I think AAC does sound slightly better when I was playing around with codecs a while back. With If you go into developer mode on a phone, depending on which phone you have, if you're running Android, you can actually pick the codec that you're using as long as the device supports it. And I've gone from Aptex to AAC to SPC and listened to the differences with the same headphones before. And AAC sounds a little bit better than SPC does, but your car well, part is not because using it's AAC. Not, it's not transcoded at that point. Um, oh, yeah. So... That's some advantage, but that's a pretty serious rabbit hole we should probably run away from. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Forget I said anything. No, 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 no. I didn't say that. Um, whole bunch of quarterly reports uh, or, you know, earnings reports came out in the last week. Uh, Samsung's Samsung got hammered. Uh, you know, they were down 56% for the same quarter last year. Um Weaknesses and price drops in the memory chip market has persisted as data center customers continue to adjust their inventories. Uh, so it ain't phones, it ain't computers, but apparently it's uh, big old warehouses full of computers and electrical connections and cooling to power stuff on the Internet. Uh, it's also interesting, uh, you know, uh, is a, it's, a, it's, it's interesting to read. Uh, Chumo Juan uh, did a write-up for ZDNets. Um, and one of the things he notes is unlike competitors that have been affected by the trade restrictions, such as SK Hynix, which has said it would lower its production rate of memory chips, Samsung has made no such announcement. Um, you know, because they also invested a staggering amount of money uh, in building out uh, production. So, you know, uh, I, you know, it, it's, I am curious, uh, I'm curious to see how that works out because when they scheduled all of this stuff to be built, memory prices were kind of at an all time high. Um, so, uh, you know, Samsung, uh, uh, all didn't refer quote, didn't refer to it in the fiscal report, but, uh, you know, part of the challenge on profits was the lack of the, or the delay on the galaxy fold launch. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it continues to be a challenging environment because I think it was uh, Qualcomm sales were down, although they noted they're well positioned for the 5G bump because basically 4G cell phone sales are slowing as people are like, oh, I need a 5G phone, but the 5G phones are barely available and nobody wants to buy most of the 5G phones that are out there right now. And of course, you probably can't get 5G service uh, unless you're in a fairly incredibly short list of urban environments. Uh, AMD is down because Wall Street thought they were going to sell $150 million more goods than they did, but that's out of like 1.8 billion, I think, in sales. Um, yeah. You know, and compared to the dark years, I think AMD is doing just fine. I think AMD is also going to have a fairly hefty bump this summer because of the uh, 5,000 series cards and, of course, the 3,000 series processors. Apple has barreled its way back up 1%. And, uh, you know... Uh, and iPhone sales kind of still suck, um, at least if you're used to sales going up year after year after year. Uh, but they are up 1% from the $53.3 billion in sales uh, last year or last quarter. So this uh, quote is enough to stop the company's multi-quarter revenue slide, end quote, uh, says Mike Murphy over at Quartz.com. Um, so it's also crazy. If you scroll down on the the article, uh, you look at there's a, a chart that right there, it's a chart of the percentage of quarterly avenue, Apple revenue coming from iPhone sales. And it's amazing to realize that depending on where you're looking in this chart, um, as much as 70% of Apple's revenue is iPhone sales at this point, which uh, if you look at that chart, if you're watching the video, if you look on the right side of that chart, uh, you'll see it's dropped way down and is starting to approach the kind of all-time low of, uh, or I should say the, the low on the chart at least of 45% of the revenue, which was back in mid-2012. So... Um, it's it's interesting to realize also just how much of 
Apple's revenue uh, comes from the iPhone. So uh, yeah, they services they're the though, iPhone managed, company now. They're the iPhone yeah. and Apple Watch company who also make some. They make a lot of MacBooks that get sold, but the desktop side is obviously nowhere near what any of the major PC manufacturers are. And that's because yeah. of you know the ecosystem and whether perceived or actual higher costs of entry, although they, they did lower the prices. They got they, they sent me an email today saying that they had a new 13-inch MacBook Pro with Touch Bar for $1299. And the MacBook hmm. Air is 1100 But still, we're talking about laptops that started about a grand. And for a right. lot of people who are mostly on laptops, they look at laptop prices, and you can buy a Windows laptop starting at about three, 400 bucks. Apple looks insanely expensive. Of course, yeah. you have laptops they've also- on both sides that are expensive. Like this laptop, I think is around four, $1,400, but you get know. what it's, you pay for. It's, you know, it's challenging to look at also because, um, you know, it, it's, I, I don't know. It's frustrating. The, the, the delays in updates to a lot of the MacBook lines have been really, really frustrating for MacBook users. Uh, but, uh, it's crazy. Um, Apple's the, the kind of the biggest growth in Apple has been, uh, services, which is like, Everything, apps, games, movies, music, cloud storage, Apple Pay. Um, that's their second largest business uh, for the last three or four years now. So um, it's, uh, and they're, you're talking about a lot of money, somewhere in the neighborhood of $12 billion on services in the last, you know, <laughs> in the last year or you know, the last quarter. Um, I wonder how much. Also- up like 50%. Like Apple Watch sales are insane at this point, especially compared to, yeah. you know, everybody else yeah. selling. And basically, nobody sells watches compared to Apple at this point. Uh, I exaggerate slightly, but a lot less than you might think. So I wonder how much of all of this in general, not just Apple, but just right. this down year, we have AMD who's, well, they're waiting for that rise and bump because that, that last quarter didn't really include the new stuff, like you said. But Apple kind of being flat, Samsung being down. Uh, you have to think that some of this was due to the fact that I w- I'd love to let's just blame Intel for everything. They're being late on 10 nanometer, which they've they've been really late now. That has reduced the number of people upgrading their laptops because there's just nothing really new out there. And then with PC sales not being gangbusters, look at the mobile side, which is where all the business has been. That's been pretty flat. That Apple chart we looked at, if you're watching the video, you see kind of the seesaw. Well, Apple does these mid-level like refreshes. They do like the the S refreshes, which they've been doing for you know almost all along. And this last round of iPhones was just the 10s. So if you already had a 10, a lot of people were saying it wasn't worth upgrading. I'm one of those people. So a 10 right. versus a 10s, pretty minor improvement there. If you're not running benchmarks, it's like no improvement. So uh, when the next amazing, completely different looking, and unfortunately that does matter a lot, aesthetics matter with these phones. If somebody looks at it and cannot tell the difference between two handsets, where's the compelling reason to upgrade when somebody's spouting some sort of spec bump to you and the camera isn't noticeably better, it doesn't operate noticeably faster, and they give you the new software for free anyway. And I think people Hmm. are absolutely hanging on to their phones longer than they have been, especially with iterative updates. The last Samsung phone that came out looked just like the one before it, and Apple does the same thing. Samsung has basically modeled their entire smartphone business after Apple. Uh, Just look at that dongle, if that's the real dongle. And we've seen a lot of other things too, but, you know, the... It, there's going to come a point when some, either somebody's going to have to innovate or it, everything's going to stagnate. And this is a commodity item now. Even if it's $1,000, it's still a commodity item because people are just buying it on their phone plan. They pay $20 or $30 a month. Uh, they don't really think about it. It's just added to their phone bill and they just have a phone. And where's the compelling reason to upgrade? Unless you're you know crazy like me and always get a phone every year, regardless of whether it's better or not. And I've bounced around from Apple to various Nexus handsets and kind of back to Apple and over to Samsung. And, you know, it's the the innovative new stuff. And clearly these companies have tried to innovate. Look at the folding phones. Does Samsung need a folding phone in 2019? 
Absolutely not. They're not going to sell very many of them, but it's something new, something to inject some sort of new life because the paradigm is the same. It's, it's a slab that's mostly screen or almost all screen, and that's, that's it. You, you can take away buttons. You can take away uh, ports, but that's really the what else is there to do with this? At some point, I think that wearables are going to be a much bigger category but the size of something, even like this Apple Watch I'm wearing, this is the large size of the Apple Watch. Do you want to stare at a screen this small and, and actually <laughs> respond to text messages? You can, you can actually write on this thing with your finger. It has fingerprint recognition. The Newton lives on in 2019, oh. but uh, it needs to be bigger and be useful. Again. <laughs> it, it, the Newton lives on, Patrick. Accept it. No. I mean, I, I get that you want a pet boy. Um, or Pip Boy, I should say, you know, your massive six inch screen on your wrist so you can do your Wonder Woman imitation uh, while being able to actually read the text. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll be honest with you, you know, uh, half the time the text on a phone this big, which is hardly a small screen, is difficult to read at this point. But um, eh, we'll see. It's it's all evolving much slower than we expected. Um, I got nothing. I got one last thing, actually. Okay. Uh, Alphabet, i.e. the giant company formerly known as Google, um, uh, has $117 billion stockpiled and is now seems to have the largest cash stockpiles of any organization because uh, Apple, who at one point had a $163 billion socked away, is down to $102 billion. So if you're wondering who's got all the money, Alphabet. Actually, you know, so does Apple. As far as I'm concerned, you know, everybody should have 102 billion squirreled away for a rainy day, uh, or 117 billion for that matter. But uh, you know, uh, if you're wondering, believe me, they can afford to put headphone jacks <laughs> on all the Google Pixel. Back on phones. the soapbox again. Uh, it's over, goodness. Patrick. People don't care about headphones anymore. It's just you. Oh man. Yeah, it's it's. I'm just gonna let that go. Oh my goodness, PCPer.com's website to find more Mr. Sebastian Peak's work. I suspect there is benchmarking going on for yet another project launch or test. But if you keep your eyes close to the web page, you'll know just as soon as the 570 chipset is behaving the way he wants it to, the way we all want it to. And uh, you'll probably know when those next generation 3950s are out, which of course won't be till September, but that's like a month away now. And I have dreams, dreams, I say, of faster encoding. I'm Patrick Norton. You can find me, of course, here at This Week in Computer Hardware. And we've got new episodes coming up next week on This Week. No, on AVXL, AVEXCEL.com, which is uh, the audio and home theater and video podcast I host with Robert Heron. We would love it if you came to check that out. And, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, if, you, if you're new, if this is a strange and wondrous experience and you'd like to repeat it, this is This Week in Computer Hardware. We call it Twitch, and you can find it at twit.tv slash twitch, including links to each and every show that we have recorded, which is hundreds at this point, and, of course, links to download it on your favorite podcatcher, or you can just search for This Week in Computer Hardware or Twitch on your favorite podcatcher. And we will probably be there. Or just hit the subscribe to audio or subscribe to video button. We're here for you on just about every freaking platform possible to stream video or audio. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening. If you have questions, tweet at Sebastian Peak or at Patrick Norton. We'd love to answer them next week. And with that, I'm Patrick Norton. And I am Sebastian Peak. We'll catch you next week on Twitch.